got some dogs out here, huh? That's my mother-in-law's dog. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, can you see the screen? It has a, the title and it has a picture? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is from a different student, but I wanted to show you sort of how the setup would be. Uh, you're going to need to have, and, and you pretty much do this, I think. You have your header. Uh, you need to come up with a title. Title. That, right. Yeah, that's going to, uh, you know, relate to the writing that's going to come. So that's something that you kind of come up with. Uh, mm -hmm. You just need to have your last name and your page number up there. And we can talk a little bit more about that if you don't have it. But underneath right. your title, you're going to need your ad. You're going to have to copy and paste that ad in there. And what you may have to do is, you don't want to make it too small like this because I can't see it. But at the same time, you don't uh -huh. want to make it too big. That's going to take, it's going to screw up the rest of the paper. So a good size, you know, a good medium size would be right there. Uh, but what you're going to need to do underneath is you're going to have to create this citation. And the way to go about okay. doing that is you're going to need your, um, you're going to need whatever that address that you looked at that particular ad. And I'm just mm -hmm. going to use, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to go back because what you're going to need to use is this place called easybib.com. And okay. it will help you create the citation. Because when you get on this page, you're basically going to say it's going to give you two uh, options. You want to go create citation. And if you're using a website, which most of us are, you're going to hit website. Uh, okay. And then you can copy and paste your website in there. And it's going to walk you through what you might need to fill in or what you might not need to fill in. So let me give you an example. Let me just go to a regular website um, okay. just to show you what I was talking about. Let's say I want to cite this from CNN. So I'm going to go up to the top here. and I'm basically going to copy that address. And then I'm going to go back to EasyBib, and I'm going to basically paste that in there. And hopefully, if EasyBib does its job, yes, this is this is the article. So I want to go ahead and hit Cite. And notice here on the on the left, you might not be able to see little check marks. But there's green check marks. That's basically saying the program has done that for you, so you don't have to worry about typing or look, you know, locating that stuff. The stuff over here okay. in orange, you may have to go back and look at. Sometimes EasyBib will do it once you hit Continue. But if not, you may have to go back to that web page or that source and, you know, start investigating that page to see if you can find, in this case, the uh, publisher or the sponsor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hit continue. And if you look, it pretty much did everything for me. Um, now, some things, depending on where you're getting that, you may have to go and kind of switch out and, you know, add in on your own. Uh, otherwise, it should be able to, you know, pick stuff up for you. And then you just want to go down here where it says complete citation. Go ahead and complete it. And it's going to give you, you know, it's going to give you a citation. So what you're going to do is you want to copy the citation. And let's say this was my paper again. You want to do uh, fig, F-I-G, which basically means figure, figure one. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to just uh, right underneath. Well, yeah, just right underneath your picture here, you're just going to basically copy and paste that uh, citation right into, right in there. Okay. And that's, te that's telling me where you're getting your information from, because unless you took that picture or you made that ad yourself, you have to give credit to somebody else. Gotcha. And then once you do that, you can start, you know, you're going to indent and then you're just going to, you know, go ahead and start your paper uh, because the other paper I was going to show. Uh, well, that's what you sort of did. The only thing that you're missing is you need to have, of course, you need to go back and do the title, which you can do that. But you just underneath your title, you need your ad. Right. I figured that it was supposed to be somewhere, but I was going to do it on the back page. I'm glad I, you let me know it's got to be on the front. Yeah. On the and then really papers. what you'd have to do, you know, you go up here, you double click, you can put your last name. Uh-huh. Like I'm doing. And then uh, if that, do it again up here. You might need to do it for page two. Let's see if mm -hmm. it picks up for page three. Sometimes it, it'll kick up for you. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, it did. And then right here, because you don't need all this stuff, right. 
we just get up here and get rid of that. And I don't know what this is. Must be some kind of graph. And uh, course number. Right. That's all that, the stuff we did for the last paper. Yeah. It's just you know, the only difference is you're going to have an ad and you're talking about an ad now. Gotcha. So that's basically, so, I mean, I, I will go through and look at this a little bit more. I hope to get something back to you. If not tonight, definitely tomorrow. Okay. Um, the other thing is if you, let me see. It should still be in your week. I think I moved it into this week's folder, so it should be up in there. But you should remember something from last week that gave you sort of a template for SA2. And, right. you know, if you're having a hard time figuring out where to go next or how many paragraphs you need to do or how, do, how should you structure your essay, well, this basically is a generic form of, of an SA2. If you follow what they're wanting you to put in it, by the paragraphs here, Roman numeral two would be body paragraph one. Roman numeral three is body paragraph two. And then, you, as you can tell, you got your logos, pathos, ethos, paragraph. So, really, you're you're going to have probably a seven to eight paragraph paper, which is roughly going to be you know three to four pages. Pages, right? Right. And if you notice some of these questions. Or some of these statements, brief description of your ad. If you go back to blog five, you've already provided some of that in one or two sentences. So what you want to do is go back and see if you can extend those answers and combine stuff. Okay. So if you're able, if you did blog five and you did it well, which most folks did who turned it in, you pretty much did your pre-writing. In some ways, you created your own outline, maybe without knowing it. You just have to go back and extend, because if you notice, the last three questions on those blogs dealt with these rhetorical appeals. Yeah. So if you just go back and add four or five more sentences, you've got a paragraph. So uh, with that, it's just basically with the paragraphs, they need to, to be organized to where what you're reading you, when you're doing an essay, they need to be, you can't just jump into it. If you right. get what I'm saying? Yes. So that was, you know, me trying to, because I read all those things over and over again. I was like, oh, I don't want it. You can't just jump into it. It has to all line up with, with the Yeah, essay. and, that, and that's why together. I gave you the, yeah, that's why I give everybody this, uh, this particular outline, because it, it, if you do follow it, it will start to flow. Okay. Because, you know, again, if you did the blog five, like everybody should should have done it the right way the first time, you just have to expand on some of those answers. Right. Because if you remember, I think it was question three or four, it talked about target audience in the publication. Right. So I think, yeah, and right here, this is where I was getting at. You could have eight paragraphs because if you want, you can break target audience up to be in one paragraph and the publication to be in another paragraph. Right. So you could do that if like, if you like to. Um, logos, pathos, and ethos are going to be separate paragraphs. So, you know. So with the the the, the um, discussion of the target audience, how, how would you start something like that off? The way I started it, I don't think it would. Because basically, you you start off, you describe what you're seeing in the picture is what you're saying. Describe what you see. Right. And then you go into uh, who's the target audience. Mm -hmm. So basically, you would just be. Um, well, so remember, if, if you get back to essay one, we talked a little bit about who the audience of a narrative and a descriptive paper would be. And usually we said it would pretty much be, you know, people in the class, the teacher maybe a universal audience. But if you look mm -hmm. here, what they're really wanting you to zero in on is what, what is the age? What is the sex? What is the race? What is the class? What is the education? What is the marital status of your particular target audience? Right. So if you were selling, let's say, uh, Dove shampoo, mm -hmm. who would be? One, who would be your target audience for Dove shampoo? Would it be kids? Would it be teenagers? Would it be young women? Would it be young men? Would it be babies? I mean, that's you got to kind of figure that out. And it all depends right. on what your ad is. 
if it if it's a woman with you know dove um dove products chances are it's probably a young woman right um it, it may be in like a cosmo magazine that would be your publication but then you got to sort of look at okay what type of women really read cosmo uh what what is sort of the age limit what is sort of maybe their education status what is sort of are they single possibly or are they married some of it you might not be able to answer you know truthfully uh right. the ones that you can answer truthfully obviously you want to put that in your paragraph but then, you know, for some of them, you might have to speculate a little bit. Right. I mean, for my, you know, ad for that, I know that it would be, you know, parents and, and um, it basically it was no gender because basically parents, you got a man and you got a woman. Okay. And for, you know, for just uh, young adults in general, kids copy what they do so i mean the basically it's pretty much everyone besides okay. kids you know okay so. and, and that's what you need to you know you need to put that in there you could also say well if it's parents then it could also be grandparents that's right um, and caregivers you're right yeah you could also say uh you could talk a little bit about the race could be any race anybody that you know is a parent or a grandparent well that can fit in anybody's you know that could be anybody's race just like it could be in anybody's gender so you could talk about that um the age you can sort of talk about you know maybe the common age of being a parent now that kind of changes over the time but you can you know you can kind of think about maybe what would be an acceptable age to be a parent you know, 2020, maybe um, you can think about the class. And what I mean by class, are they is it fit to a middle class? Is it more for a rich class? Is it more for a, you know, a poor or lower class? That's what I sort of get at being class and the education. Right. Is it is it high school level? Is it, you know, two year college? Is it bachelor degree? Is it master's level? Is it professional? That type deal. OK, so. You may not be able to answer all of those, but you could probably answer some of them just by looking at who's, you know, part of the ad and then start thinking about, well, who would really pick this up and enjoy it? If, you know, if you were at Books A Million or Barnes & Noble and came across a magazine section and you picked this up, would it be beneficial to you? Is it Does it fit you as an audience member or would it? That's somebody different because we all know that certain clothes that you buy, you know, they may fit, you know, they may have the style of an older person more so than how old you are. Right. So it's like, you know, if you're 40 years old, do you want to dress up like your granny now? Probably not. <laughs> and, you know, certain clothes when you go to Walmart or when you go to Target or when you go to Belts or even when you shop on Amazon. They have it sort of targeted to a particular gender, obviously, and age appropriate. So that's what you have to sort of look at. Not too many 25 year olds are wanting to dress up like their grandma or grandpa right now. Right. But at the same time, you're probably not going to find too many 85 or 90 year olds wanting to dress up like a 15 or 16 year old right now either. Right. So that's what we mean by target audience. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I, I'm just. I think I'm. I'm overthinking the flow of it. Okay. I think. I think that's what I'm having a hard time with trying to go from just driving the picture to the target audience. How mm -hmm. would you? Because um, whenever you, uh, you do want like the um, the paragraph. The, the topic sentences at the beginning, right? Yeah, that's yeah. You really need to have topic sentences, at right? The yeah, because that that basically sort of controls uh, right. what's to come later in the paragraph. Well, what you can do is use sort of like transitional words, you know, transitioning from one idea or one paragraph to another, like you know, in addition to or moreover or likewise or however, because uh, you're in a lot of ways you're sort of adding on to one idea to the next when you're doing gotcha. that step. got it i think that that's what i'm i'm really overthinking trying to make sure that it all kind of is not just like a whole bunch of 
oh, okay, what am I reading now? She's jumping from here to here to here to here to here. Right. And it's not really going together like it should. And, and I will look at that when I do some, when I look at your drafts, and I, if there's something going on like that, I'll point it out. I don't know if you had a chance to send it to Smart Thinking yet. I haven't, um, but I was going to do that as well. But th that, what I sent, is it's not finished. I just wanted to see if I was on the right track. Okay. Because I was, like I said, I was kind of overthinking, like, the whole organization of this, the analyzed essay. So I was like, okay, I don't know. So what I'm going to do, I need to see if I'm even yeah. remotely close or anything like that. Uh, I mean, from what I'm what I'm telling now, because I didn't get a chance to really read all of it, but I'm looking at, I'm looking at your thesis statement here. Adult behavior has a great influence on future choices of children. Okay, that's good. Um, let's see the recent advertisement. Okay, good. Yeah, I think really what's going to pull that's 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 sort of the reason why I wanted to show you how to do the the whole picture in the ad. Picture, uh, right. Yeah, you really need to have that there because I. When I'm looking at this, I'm wanting to go back and looking at the picture. You see what I'm saying? Right. Um, so I'm trying to picture stuff in my head right now. Um, but I think for, let me see. Because you talk about the color, targeting parents. So this is what you could do. You can make this sort of maybe, you know, talk about this a little bit more, but make it its own paragraph. Okay. Uh, the color stuff goes really well with what you're talking about here in this particular paragraph. So I think you really need to make this its own paragraph. You know, it could be a little smaller or shorter because if you mention every single audience member that, you know, could target, you, you're going to be going on forever. Right. So I would probably hit the high notes on that, you know, talk, you know, explain a little bit about, you know, what these type of parents could possibly, are they professional parents, you know, are they middle class, are they educated, that type deal. Uh, because I think here where you're talking about the color, yeah, see what, what I would do here, I would probably take this and I'd probably lead back up to it. Okay just so you can have that topic sentence, you know what I'm saying? Right. But I think right here, this would be, this should be another paragraph. So you need to probably get this out because you just moved it. Okay. And then this, uh, you could probably attach it back up here. Gotcha. And that might be, so here's your introduction. This is body paragraph one. Body paragraph two starts here when you start talking about targeting the target audience. Gotcha. And then if we go back to our outline, it's uh, if you wanted to break that up, right? If you feel like your target audience paragraph is really short, you can add this type of publication. At publication. This I, I think I would add the publication to it as well. Yeah. And then you just, yeah, and then you just go in and go back and look at how did you answer number 11, 12, and 13, 13. and just see if you can expand, you know, go from, you know, one sentence to maybe five now. Gotcha. For each one of those uh, particular questions, you put that in together, you have a conclusion. You might be doing that with these. I didn't start think I didn't start really reading too much about the logos yet. Gotcha. But I think once you start figuring where things go. I think once you figure out this whole targeting deal, I think the rest of it will sort of fall in place for you. Gotcha. Got it. Because you're it almost, I mean, you're sense. almost, at, you're already at three. So I think once you add the targeting and you go back and just make sure that you're tweaking up the, uh, you know, make sure you got the logos, the pathos and the ethos, the way you want it styled and, and everything. And you got a conclusion right. and, you should be, you should be wrapping up with this in the next couple of days. I'm thinking, right? Because you got a good bit of your work done. It's just going back and doing that targeting and publication paragraph, and then going back and really make sure. And what I say by that is, you probably want to use some of these these terms, like the logo says this, the pathos is this, the ethos, because that's going to tell your reader that you're really focusing on those particular paragraphs that I'm deal with you said that because I was, I would, I didn't want to put that in there because I didn't know if that would be something 
that you would want. Yeah. You know, because they're key terms. You can, you can interchange, right. you can say logos or you can say logical appeal, they okay. pathos or emotional appeal. So you can interchange that. And that's basically telling me that, Hey, she knows what these terms mean because now she's effectively using them here in this paper. Got it. So okay. She's learning something. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yep. It makes perfect sense. Okay. Yes. How's everything else coming? Everything else is coming right along. Um, I, I think I do a lot of overthinking when it comes to this class. Cause I just want to it. Oh my God. <laughs> so that's just it. But it, it's coming right along because what you just said makes complete sense. And really and truly, I could have probably been finished if I had not overthinked a lot of it. But I'm glad that I had a chance to be able to talk to you so you can break it down for me and let me know. Yeah, I think, yeah, Desiree had a, uh, hey, Desiree, I see that you joined in here. I'm glad yeah. you have that, too. Uh, she had a little issue, too, about the whole deal, because she wanted to do, you know, she had one ad for her blog, and then she sent me something else. So I was kind of confused. I was like, well, are you too, are you changing your ad? Are you trying to do two different ones? So uh, she called, and we were able to set up a Teams meeting. So, you know, anytime Monday or Wednesday, pretty much after 10 o'clock, you know, if, if you have time and you want to meet for a few minutes or whatever it needs to be, I can set aside some office hours and I can send you sort of like an individual teams meet where if it would help me, you know, go over on this screen here visually uh, about how to do stuff, I can do that. I just need to know if, you know, because sometimes you can talk about things over the phone and it sort of makes sense at the time, but it, unless you really show it, it's not really going to make too much sense two hours after you leave the conversation. So um, that's why I'm throwing out there. I don't know how your schedule is. Mondays and Wednesdays usually work fine for me after 10 because I have, I do have a class from eight to about nine 20. Tuesdays and Thursdays would be, I wouldn't say it would be difficult, but I have three classes spread out. I'm in Camden. And the uh, because it's a new center down there, I wouldn't be able to use a whole lot. Well, I might be able to because they're still trying to get some of the audio and video equipment and stuff like that for our computer. So we could try that out if it came down to you needed something really, you know, on a Tuesday or Thursday. But definitely Mondays and Wednesdays work really well for me after 10. If you, you know, say you send me an email and say, hey, can you really can you give me 15 minutes and can we meet on Teams? And, you know, yeah. Well, that's good to know because um, I know that you have like many classes and I'm not sure of your schedule, but being that you are a professor, I'm sure that you're busy. So, yeah, well, yeah, I got nearly six. Well, I do. I have six classes. So. Right. Right. So um, didn't want to be like a hog because, I mean, I know when you do these, I mean, people, if they can make it, they can. If they can't, they can't. But I'm going to try my best to make it because these are very informative for me and okay. make me understand it more so that team thing sounds sounds good um just being able to make it work is that's it yeah what i may do because usually on a normal semester when we didn't have covid and stuff uh most uh full-time folks here was supposed to provide four hours throughout the week of tutoring well because of covid that sort of is, you know, hampering on a lot of people's parades. So what I may do on uh, Mondays and Wednesdays when I don't have a whole lot going on, like grading and that type of stuff, I may just let it sort of give office hours, um, let's say from two to four or whatever the case may be. We'd still be able to maybe do some of these uh, meetings here, but maybe I can open up, you know, an hour for tutoring, say, you know, like I said, two, maybe two to three on a Monday and then two to three on a Wednesday or something of that nature. So if you needed to come and get some help, you can get some help. But then if you wanted to stay for, let's say, you know, the weekly Wednesday meeting, you can do that as well. Uh, I may try that going into the next few weeks to see if that is a little bit more feasible for folks. Because I think sometimes when, when I send these out and they say, well, well, darn, does he want me to stay an hour? Does he want me to stay two hours? And, and really, 
this, I mean, most classes last 75 to 80 minutes. Um, we can't mandate these um, at this point. So, because everybody's got different schedules and they get kids and I understand that. Uh, so really the whole weekly thing was to show up, you know, within that 75 or 80 minute range. If you want, some days we may have to stay a little later if you really, you know, depending on what we're, we're talking about. But you don't necessarily have to stay the whole time because I will be recording if a good amount of folks show up. Like I'm recording this one now okay. um, just because I know some folks are probably going to wonder about the whole deal about the picture of the ad and stuff. Because I, I knew I wasn't the only one. And I'm like, well, I, I, I've got to talk to him because this is important. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's necessary to be able to talk to you, you know. To, to see exactly what you're looking for so you don't end up turning in something that is like way off of what you're looking for. Yeah, and, and that's why I, I'm thinking about maybe just opening up maybe an hour or two on Mondays and Wednesdays in case, you know, if you just want to drop in and, you know, you got something real quick, well, stay 10 minutes, we talk about it, and then bam, you can go back and do whatever you got to do. Um, right. You know, if you want to stop, you know, stop in and stay 30 minutes. I mean, whatever the case may be, I may let that sort of, uh, I may try it next week and see how it goes. I may start with one day to see if there's a lot of traction with it. Um, if, you know, it starts picking up, we may start doing that a little bit more. Um, just because, you know, maybe folks won't feel like, well, I don't have to stay the whole time. I can just come and get a question answered or whatever and, and then sort of leave and go back to work or whatever. And that's fine. Because you can only do so much on, e you know, via email too. Yeah. I mean, and it's not the same as being able to talk to you firsthand either. So. Right. So I may try that, you know, next Monday, maybe do something, maybe, maybe three to four or four to five or something like that. And uh, just leave it open. Sort of like a, you know, free office hours, drop in if you need, you know, have any questions. Um, if you don't have anything, then, you know, you don't necessarily have to, uh, drop in. You can always email me or whatever, if you think it's easier to do it that way. But I, you know, I'd leave some space. I'd send everybody that link. So anybody that wants it, just click on it and join. Got it. I think people are like that. I think so. Yeah. I, I don't think it, it doesn't sound like it's too demanding like this one might be. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think that this is too demanding, Mr. Wilson, if, if I may say. I just think that sometimes it, it's a schedule conflict. Yeah. You know? Well, that's but the I'm thing, sure. too. There is a schedule conflict on my end, too, because the way they, they, they only have me for one class on Mondays and Wednesdays. And, of course, I got this online and I got another online. But by Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have three classes and they're spread out throughout the day. So by the time I really, you know, that's why I was saying, I was like, well, Monday and Wednesdays, basically from 10 o'clock to 630, I can focus on my two online courses because I don't have to go anywhere. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, that would be a little bit difficult because there I pretty much have like, I have two classes sort of back to back and then I have this big gap. But it's still, I mean, it's three classes, you know, that are meeting two days a week compared to meeting a couple of times online or whatever. So that's why I was going with my times and my dates because it just, it worked better for me. Right. And, you know, initially I sent out stuff like feel, feelers the first week or so. And I never really heard anything back, which days work, which hours work. I mean, I, some folks said, well, you know, I'll work 40 hours or I'll work here or there. And, you know, and, and basically I was like, well, I'll record it and you can always watch it. Um, right. But I didn't hear because we had nearly, I think, 25 students. And I think maybe I heard from five or six. So then I was like, well, I mean, I can't wait around. So these are the hours. These, these are the dates. So, and that's sort of how I went with it. Gotcha. Because I don't know, you know, I think too with online folks think it's a little easier and then they start checking emails and wanting to do the work, you know, on Saturday or, you know, Sunday, four or five hours before something is due. When, you know, by then it's kind of hard for me to do a whole lot. I mean, it, 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 yeah, I mean, if you waited six days to start, then right. that's sort of on you. 
I don't think that it's, it's easier because, I mean, having one-on-one -on -one is a little bit easier because then you get exactly what you need. I think for a little bit, it's a little harder because mm -hmm. you got to discipline yourself to make sure that you do it. And just like you're saying, many people probably do jump on on Saturdays, but I know I have to jump on on Mondays just to see yeah. and make sure I check it every day so that I can be on track and know that I'm not missing out on anything because you can go and put something on there day by day and you may miss something you know and then yeah. now Saturday's here and you got six things that you got to do so now you're up all night you well, know? I, yeah well I try to get everything look once it loads up or pops up I try to get everything that's already there so I don't go you know sometimes there might be something I might have to change a little bit but I usually let folks know but for the most part, whatever you see that Sunday or Saturday when it pops up, that's pretty much going to be that week. I'm not going to go back in there and load up a whole bunch of stuff. Right. Um, that's usually uh, you can count on um, you not changing anything. But sometimes, I mean, some of my classes I've seen, they add a few things. And yeah. Okay. I hate when they do that because I, I used to, you know, I was a student too. And I hated that you go on Monday and you saw, you know, five or six things and then you go back Tuesday and there's like 20 things now. Right. It's like, what the exactly. heck? You know, I mean, and, it, and sometimes they may give you an email about it and sometimes they may not. So I try not to do that unless there's just, there's a reason behind it and a reason why I have to do it. And a lot of it is, you know, if there's a time constraint, uh, a lot of times I sort of, you know, move stuff around to make it work because I know how it is. I got six classes and that's just, you know, X amount of stuff I got to grade two. So I try to make it work for, for those that are taking the class, but I also try to work it for myself. So I have enough time to balance all the classes and balance everything else I got to do outside of class two. So, I mean, just like anybody else, I got two young daughters. So right. they're, yeah, they're, you know, a, a really a, a bounce of joy when you're trying to do stuff at home because one six and one's two so oh goodness you know by the time i get home seven eight o'clock at night i you know now i'm going from being you know mr professor wilson to being daddy wilson and sometimes right. it's hard to do a whole lot you know once they're there since we have to work our 10 hours here usually i see him a couple hours you know a couple minutes in the morning and then you know right before bedtime during the week so right and that's, you know, that's why I say I try to do, I try to give it a balance for everybody because I know how it is. If you work, you got multiple jobs, you got multiple classes, you got multiple kids. Um, it's hard once you get home sometimes to focus on the stuff to focus on when, you know, other things in life become more important at that point. And, you know, you want to spend time with your kids and your loved ones and, and, and stuff like that. That's why I try not to make my class overly domineering you know well i know you got four classes but mine's the only one important no i'm going by our criteria that we have to do from the state of georgia but i'm trying to do it in a way that you know we can spread it out because some folks that teach this class they may have more than i do some may have less but i try to do sort of right there in the middle to give you that you know that really that basic college English field because if you had to go off somewhere else or if you take another English class they're going to expect that you already know how to you know do the MLA stuff they're going to expect probably you know to know how to write a research paper at some point and how to cite and how to analyze and think for yourself you know a lot of places like Georgia Southern or Valdosta if you go off there they, they sort of kind of expect that you've already learned it in high school right and you know we know how the high schools are around this area they don't really teach, teach. like they should for college ready folks you know i graduated in 98 from Glen academy and i was in college prep classes and when i got to my first college english class there at, uh well it was a two-year college it, it was the community college here in brunswick um and I, you know, mid 40s and 50s on my paper, I was like, well, damn, they didn't really teach me really well 9th through 12th grade. And even though these were college prep classes and I made A's and B's on them, I didn't know what the heck was, you know, a comma splice was yes. because they didn't teach us. 
And, and, and again, that sort of fell back on the high school teachers were thinking that the middle school teachers taught us. So it started that whole vicious cycle. Well, by the time you get to ninth grade, you should already know how to write and do paragraphs and do essays. We're just going to give you the assignment and you're just going to have to start going with it. So, and I hate that. That's why we do a little bit of the grammar. I know some folks are, uh, some are doing decent on the grammar quizzes and some are not, but the reason why we're sort of doing the grammar is that if, if you did go to another English class, chances are they're just going to assume that you know how to do the grammar and they're not even going to worry about it. They're going to say, well, if you have issues with fragments, go see a tutor. All right. And they're usually that, you know, that sort of cold about it too. Well, if you get, you know, you should have already learned that by now, but if you have issues to it, you know, here's the tutor hours. Just make sure you don't do it in the next paper. You're going to be losing more points because right. that was the thing. When I when I had English 1101, when you made a comma slice for that particular teacher I had, he took about 25 points for each one. Oh. So if you made two, you basically failed, and he stopped the paper. He stopped grading. So if you made two in the first two sentences, he just stopped. It doesn't matter how long the paper was because, I mean, you're already out of 50. What's the difference? Right. Oh, whoa. So at least I don't do it that way. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Yeah, he had a really weird way about doing stuff, but, I, you know, I kind of learned that because he was like, well, you got a couple choices. You can either drop out and kind of quit or you can, you know, suck it up and start reading the, you know, the grammar book and try to get better. Right. So I was like, well, I guess if you put it that way, I didn't come here to fail. Absolutely not. So it, it was rough, but you know, it can be done. I think I was just more ticked off at my, of the education that Glen County was given at the time, I guess, because I was like, man, I, I took all these college prep classes and they were supposed to prepare me for college, hence the name college prep, but they didn't really prepare me for English. Have has a lot of things changed though as or it's just some things changed but not a lot when it comes to the english grammar from you know no really i mean what they should have done they should have did more refreshing i think in high school because the comma is going to be a comma no matter what uh, okay. sentence fragment paragraphs nothing has really changed as much it, what has changed is how much teachers really spend on, you know, maybe refreshing or reteaching some of those um, rules that you probably started learning about commas in the second grade. And the thing is, you started learning a little bit more in the third grade and then a little bit more in the fourth and then the fifth. And by the time you get to middle school, they only spend a couple of time, you know, a couple of days on it, and they just move on to something else. So by the time you get to ninth grade, they just expect that K through eight did their job, and that you remembered uh, how to use a comma. So they focus mainly on reading and comprehension and critical thinking skills, is which is what you need as well. Um, but they don't focus on the writing as much because they just assume that you know. All your other teachers must have done a really good job. So if anything has really changed, it, it's probably the way, you know, now that we're we're having to type papers instead of handwrite them. Um, we, we're not using the typewriter anymore. The MLA style as it relates to the handbook, it changes because it goes from one edition to the next because of all the mediums that are coming in like YouTube, how to cite a phone call, how to cite a text message, that type stuff. But as it, you know, the nuts and bolts of grammar, that hasn't changed like let's say a science class has. Because, you know, our current environment now, the coronavirus, well, you know, 15 years ago, uh, we wouldn't have thought that, you know, this type of virus would basically cause a lot of, you know, cause us to go paralyzed for a little bit right because you know 15 years ago those biology and those medical books didn't have anything about SARS 2 in it right but 15 years ago that grammar handbook had stuff about how to write a research paper 
and it was still the same stuff. Gotcha. So, I mean, it's sort of like math, too. It, it's one of those things, if you don't use the math that they taught you in school on a day-to-day -day basis, you slowly start to lose some of it because you're not practicing. You're not practicing those skill sets, meaning if you're not writing essays on a day-to-day -day basis, not to say that you need to go out and write essays, but if you're not writing essays on a day-to-day -day basis or you're not doing some sort of writing where you're able to, you know, improve what you're trying to, you know, improve your uh, written communication skills, then chances are you're going to lose whatever you learned in the third grade or you know, the 10th the grade because the way we talk and the way we write are two different things, obviously. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, we, we pick up bad, bad speak, you know, speaking patterns from, well, from our friends, from our spouses, from our children, from our parents, because it's more like street lingo. It, it's stuff that we, that we can kind of, you know, recognize and that we, we say, you know, one way that we talk to our friends, to our parents, to our, you know, our husband or wife has two different, you know, three different ways than how you would speak to, uh, let's say, a doctor or uh, your boss or somebody that you didn't know. So we, we, we constantly, you know, switch out from being formal to informal sort of on a day to day basis. But it seems like when we type or when we write something, we're still sort of stuck in the informal because, you know, we always hear, well, I write papers how I speak. Well, that's good to some degree until it comes to the punctuation and stuff. Right. Because your ideas could be great, but if you don't have them in a way that we can understand them, they're not so great. Yeah. Um, that's true. In some ways, it's the difference, and, and I'm not doing this to be ha ha funny, but I mean, some way it's the difference between listening to somebody like, let's say, a Barack Obama speak mm -hmm. and somebody like Trump speak. And again, I'm not trying to get political, but you can if you go back and listen to some of their speeches, you can tell the difference. Absolutely. That's the difference between speaking and then writing for a lot of folks. <clears throat> That's or, you know, whoever, you know, you can find somebody, some of the greatest speakers in the world can really speak well, but then they can't really write all that great or vice versa. They can write really well, but they can't really speak. Speak well. Gotcha. So. But that's, yeah, that's really, I mean, it's, again, it's like the college algebra. If you're ever having to take an algebra course again or something, if you don't use that quadratic equation uh, to balance your bank account or to pay your light bill, well, I mean, if you don't use it on a day-to-day -day -day basis, eventually you're going to forget about it. What are you talking about quadratic? Well, you learned that when you took pre-algebra, probably in the eighth or ninth grade. Oh, yeah. So it takes a little bit of reinforcement and a little bit more practice. And then stuff might start to fall back in the pattern. But, you know, nothing's really changed in math either. It's just sort of, you know, right. doing it. Because really our basic uh, calculations, the only thing that we really need to do, know for, for math, unless you're going to be an engineer or if you're going to teach math, is multiplication, division, uh, adding and subtracting. That's all, that's all you need for your bills. That's all you need for your bank account. That's all you need basically for the grocery store. And, you know, everybody has a cell phone. There's a calculator on that. So really the only thing you need to know how to do is really work the calculator. Unless your phone goes down and then you really need to use your head then. Because I've seen that happen. Uh, some of the cashiers at Walmart, you know, if the computer goes down or their, their register sort of goes down, they don't know how to do basic math. It's right. like, it's like I gave you the bill is twenty or the bill is ten dollars. I gave you a twenty. I should get ten dollars back. Right. But they have to go to their phone and subtract twenty from ten to realize how much change I should get. And there's something wrong with that too. Right. Like, well, they should have learned that basic skill in school too. I, I mean, because we're not doing dealing with like complicated numbers here. It's not like I'm. You know, the bill is uh, $16.42, and I give you $43.22. I mean, it's just a basic, you know, you subtract 10 
from 20. But they still needed to go to their cell phone to, to check that. Right. Like I was lying to them. Like I was trying to rip them off. I was like, well, no, I can do it on my phone too, just to make sure that you're, believe me. So, but it's just stuff like that. Nothing's really, I mean, really, the only thing that's going to probably change is going to be like in the hard science, the chemistries, the physics, the nursing fields, the biology. Everything else, it's just going to be somebody, it's going to be a different year, a different edition of the book, and somebody else coming in and, and probably writing about commas instead of, you know, that old guy that wrote about them 50 years ago. But if, I mean, if you got kids going through high school now or grandkids or whatever the case may be, the stuff that you're learning now, you can start helping them with their homework when they come and say, hey, I got to do a research paper. Well, if you go through this class and do it well, you know how to do that now. Right. So it's going to be benefit because you can teach them something. In the meantime, you're still relearning how to do it. So it's keeping your mind fresh. And then they can pass on what they learned to somebody else. And they can keep that as a skill because when they go to their first English class in college, chances are they're going to have the right essays and they're going to, have to do research papers. So it's a cycle that keeps giving and when it, you know, you can kind of keep relearning and if they get easier, I mean, the more you do of anything, the more practice you get it. I'm not saying the work's going to get any easier, but the more, you know, essays you write, the patterns start to get a little bit easier on you. You kind of figure out, well, I did this for essay one. Maybe I can try this for a little bit for essay two and see if it works. Right. So you don't get sort of stuck in the rut where, I, you know, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Well, that's the part of, you know, having two or three weeks and going through a draft. You have time to screw up. Where you don't want to screw up is when you're trying to write that paper and it's due in two hours. Right. So it's okay to mess up. I mean, we all mess up. The problem is you want to get it right when you turn it in. Or you want to at least get a decent grade. Right. And that's pretty much, I mean, the class is like anything else. Class, you're going to get out of the class what you put in it. I, I sort of set it up as a medium level class, meaning it's not going to be too difficult unless you just don't do anything. Then, of course, if you don't study, you don't do anything, it will be difficult. It should be if you keep up, if you ask questions, send drafts. You know, show up to these teams things when you can. It should be, I mean, fairly easy to get sort of the grade or get where you want to get to. Because again, like I said earlier, um, earlier in the semester, it, it's really easy to fill this class if you just don't turn anything in or don't do anything. And then you're just wasting your time, so you just might as well not even. <laughs> Yeah, oh well, they're wasting their time more so than mine. Yeah, right. So, I mean, like, I, I usually always have to give the, the whole little spiel about that we we offer this class yearly. So, if you don't want to take it now, we will, you know, the college will gladly take your money again next semester. So, it really depends on how much money you want to keep forking out to be able to pass it. And we got some folks that will. You know, sometimes it, they do it the first time around, which is great. That's what we all want. We will want everybody to pass first time around so they can get into their major course. But, you know, I've, I've known folks that took their two-year plan and made it an eight-year plan. And I just don't understand that. Right. It's like, why do you want to be in school just about as long as it took you to get from kindergarten to middle school? Cool. Don't you want to get out? And some of them are just playing around too. They're, you know, mommy and daddy sort of forcing them to go. And they realize that, hey, if I don't go, then they're going to kick me out and I'm going to have to get a job. And then, you know, at 18 or 19 years old, that's a little bit more responsibility. And, you know, they would rather go and sort of just go through the motions just to be able to live at home, maybe rent free or not having to pay as much than to be out there on their own. And then you got others that are 18 or 19 that are really driven. Right. 
And then some that are older that come back after having life experiences with kids and a job and want to come back and do something different because they realize whatever degree they have or whatever the job they're, that they're in is just not, it's not really, a, you know, applicable to their lifestyle at this point because, you know, it's like anybody else, everything else around us keeps going up in price. The paycheck sort of stays the same unless you get a degree. And even then, it's getting where you have to get a master's degree or higher to really start making some decent money around here. Right. So because the, you know, like the two-year degree is sort of like the, the high school degree like it used to be. And the high school degree is like the GED degree. And, you know, it's just, it's hard. You know, if you just got a GED or a high school diploma, it even if you know somebody, it's still hard to get decent money. Because, I mean, you can't go and be a doctor with a GED. You can't go and be a lawyer just with a high school degree. I mean, you have to have something higher now. And you got to put in the work, whether it takes you two years to get whatever your dream job is or 15. Right. No, just look at your lap. But uh, <clears throat> I got to – actually, I got another – I got my 1102. I might have to meet with them here in about four minutes. Is there anything else that I can help you with? I don't mean to rush, but I didn't tell nope. to get on there. That's about, uh, pretty much it. You're going to send um, that paper back to me through email? I will. If it's not tonight, it'll definitely be tomorrow. Okay, no problem. So no if you problem. want, I mean, if you want to go back and add more to it and put the picture and all and send that one back, I just delete the one that you sent first and just read the newer one. It's up to you. Okay. Okay, and this that way there won't be a whole lot of confusion, maybe. And this is reco recorded, right? What was the email link at the to get the reference to the? Oh, uh, it's uh, easybib.com. Easybib. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna do that. And or if you, I mean, if, if you just go to Google, this is another thing that you can do. If you go to Google. I use EasyBib, but that's the one I've always used. But you can type in works cited generator and you're gonna find some other pages. EasyBib is the third one, but you're gonna find other ones that do basically the same thing. Okay. You just have to, you know, just follow the instructions. But if I mean if you're used to EasyBib because I showed it, it's the third one here, and you just go there and it's gonna sort of guide you through. Gotcha. And if you have any questions, just let me know about that. Because sometimes this, you know, sometimes it does kind of. It's not like it was 10 or 15 years ago, because it's like everything else. Everything wants to have ads and want to try to make money. So sometimes it will act like it's, you know, you got to pay to move forward, but you don't. Gotcha. It's just they, they threw up a 40 a 30 or 40 second uh, ad that you have to sort of let it go through its message. And then okay. you're going to be able to get back. Right. But yeah, just uh, email me or, you know, if you want, if we can do something by teams next week or something of that nature, we can do that too. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. No problem. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.